Hi, my name is Sharon Azrieli, and welcome to At Home in Canada, and you're at my home in Canada. Today, we are going to see my interview with Canadian-Israeli architect Moshe Safdi. This interview took place October 2019 in Moshe Safdi's offices in Boston. Moshe Safdi is one of the leading architects in the world today. Thank you so much for meeting with us today. We have the great honor of meeting with Moshe Safdi in his Somerville, Boston, offices. Thank you, Moshe. It's my pleasure. Like all the amazing visionaries and architects that I have um, interviewed for this series, Moshe Safdi was incredible to interview. He started out as a young student at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada and has grown to international fame and stature. We will explore his designs and his brilliant mind in this interview. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did meeting with him. But talk to me please about coming to Canada, how you started out early childhood. Well, I arrived in Canada at age 15, but um, I'm amazed as I think back how completely formed I was as a person by the time of my arrival. Uh, I look now at uh, young men at 15 and I think life is ahead of them and they've got a lot to learn. But actually by the time I arrived in Canada, I'd absorbed uh, Israel in the making. So I was born in 38. I remember some events of the Second World War. Certainly I remember uh, my hometown Haifa being bombed. Mostly I remember how amazing it was to have a childhood in Haifa, uh, an amazingly beautiful on the mountain with all the valleys, the uh, city, uh, being in the Boy Scouts, not Boy Scouts, Scouts, yeah. uh, and you know, going to work camps on the kibbutz uh, every summer and going on amazing hikes and not doing much homework, that's for sure, uh, but also absorbing the idealism of a young country. And so I arrived uh, in Montreal. Uh, I remember at the end of winter in March of 53, uh, city still covered in snow. It was quite a shock. How come uh, your parents moved to Montreal? My father was a businessman, a textile merchant, and uh, when the state was formed, it was in the early years very socialist. He used to call them the Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. And they really limited private enterprise importing and business in a very severe way. And he tried first politically to change the regime, uh, join the general Zionist, but he, 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 got, he gave up early. Uh, things changed over time. But he gave up early and decided to go to Canada. He said he couldn't make a living in that country. How did our parents meet? Do you, do you know that story? I know that my parents met your father as a young man in Zichron Yaakov. Uh, I think we went there when Haifa was being bombed. He just arrived as a young person. In any event, they had met him in Israel. But he had arrived in Canada probably the year or year after we did. And we were joined in Canada for a certain period by my cousin, Gracie Picciotto, uh, who came from, uh, from Bogota. Okay. And he was dating her. Oh boy, I wish I'd tell my mom. It was actually my mom who told me the story that my dad had been influential in telling Moshe Safdi's father to allow him to study architecture. But when I asked Moshe about that, he said, no, it wasn't so much that. It was more that it turns out that my father had been dating Moshe's cousin. So that was the first that I had ever heard about that. 
he was dating her and he would come and go. And uh, so he was a kind of a presence uh, uh, in our household. He would come for Friday dinners and uh, he would be taking out for dates. And at some point uh, they did decided that's not it. And I think she went by, back to uh, Colombia. Eventually she got married in Switzerland. So, and you know the rest of your father's story. Habitat represented for me as a kid growing up, a part of the whole man and his world and a part of all of the, uh, the, uh, the buildings that were created that really put Montreal on the map. Uh, for the world and also because we did know Moshe Safdi and he did work with my father as a young architect we were so proud to be associated with the man who made this very very beautiful and fascinating concept humanitarian concept actually like a little bit of the kibbutz concept you know for every man a garden it's a very beautiful utopian concept the idea that no matter how poor or rich you are, everybody has the same. That everybody has one box, which is their apartment that they live on, in two boxes, really. And so by having two boxes, you have one, like this is the kitchen and living box, and one which is the bedrooms box. And then the top of the bedrooms box becomes the garden for the living space. It's really beautiful, and it's like fabulous, you know, Lego that you figure out how to put it all together. And he also did a lot of other things that he really wanted to force the community to live with each other that I didn't know about, of course, at the time, because I was only a child. And um, so I write about it in, in the article. Um, I only found out at the interview, like, he only had odd numbers in the elevator. So he forced people to get off on the odd number of floors and walk. They had to meet each other. I don't know how they moved the furniture, but things like that. Habitat began as my thesis okay. at McGill University. Okay. And my thesis, I don't have the model here, was the beginning of the idea of modular boxes and gardens stacked together and so on. After graduation, I went to Philadelphia to work for Louis Kahn. And a year later, my professor, who my, was my thesis teach, uh, advisor, okay. Sandy Van Ginkel, Van Ginkel, came to Philadelphia and he said, look, we're going to have a World's Fair and I've been asked to head, put together and head the design team that will do the master plan. And I want you to come and be the chief designer. And I said, look, I'd be happy to leave Khan and come, but I have a request. Could I propose my concept for my thesis, which became Habitat, as one of the pavilions of the fair? And he says, if you do it on your spare time, you can do what you want. Okay. When I got there, I was lucky enough to get funding from the cement companies, actually. They had a $50,000 fund. Um, and I put a team together, and we took my thesis and adapted it to the site of Cité du Havre. The expo management fell in love with it and decided that the best way to uh, realize it is by taking it to Ottawa, to the cabinet. And I remember it was uh, uh, a day after Yom Kippur, we flew with the model and met with a cabinet headed by Lester Pearson and uh, uh, seven ministers and presented the project to them, which then was approved in part. It was a piece of the whole thing that they approved. Um, right. and, and, and that got built and uh, got the, the bilingual name of Habitat 67, Habitat 67. Um, so it was not a competition at all. It was a project I proposed, and I was at the right moment in the right place and managed to get it through. Uh, there was a lot of opposition once we began, and I've written a book, Beyond Habitat, which is still a bestseller. Yeah, uh, I have it. It's yeah. Right. To Every Man a Garden is, is, a, is a concept which Moshe Safdi created and elaborated on. And it's fascinating to me. I, I think I've 
brought up in every one of these videos that great thinkers, great designers, great architects all develop their own lexicon. And one of the things that he did so young as a, as a young architect of 25, he created that concept. I don't know where he got it from, but it's brilliant. It's wonderful. It's apt for the future and it's still relevant. So when he says to every man a garden, he doesn't just mean that every house and every apartment will have its own garden. He also meant he's going to create an entire community. So part of habitat, which didn't get built at that time because it was just too enormous of a concept and of an idea, was that he, he also created for that community, I mean, only a quarter of what he designed got built on, on, uh, on that island in Montreal. Later on in, in, in China, he now has built with the post office, with the shopping center, with the you know, playing fields, with whatever else is required so that you have a whole community. And the community has also, um, on the 25th floor, an entire street, which is parks, which is you know, places for the children to play and um, basketball, you know, courts, whatever is necessary. So to every man a garden is not just their own private garden, but is also the idea that uh, communities need gardens also. And he thought of everything, Moshe Safdie. It's certainly a persistent theme and the interpretation of what it means for every one a garden has evolved. I mean, to start with, you could think of cities as gardens, like for everyone a garden, you can think in terms of the whole, the whole urban environment. Does the urban environment has to be so anti-nature? You know, we have cities which are full of green and trees and parks, and we feel not detached from nature. Then the cities, Shanghai, Hong Kong, where you feel you've got to get in the plane and fly for two hours before you get to nature. Uh, so that's in a broader sense. When you're designing a housing complex, uh, a dense high-rise housing concept, the idea of habitat is arrange it in a way that everybody has a private garden. But also once you create communities of thousands of families, you need communal gardens. And so the notion of garden is both literal and metaphorical and has guided my work actually in a profound way. When I design a major commercial center for the airport, I end up making it one of the most uh, famous gardens in the world, which doesn't take away from the fact that it's a great marketplace, but side by side, there's nature and the bazaar. So with Le Corbusier, with uh, modernism, the whole idea was that form follows a function. Again, Safdie differs with that. He thinks form follows purpose. You know, that's a little bit just, you know, picking on words because what's the difference between purpose and function? The purpose of a building is essentially its function. You could argue it's the same thing. But if he wants to say purpose, I'm not going to argue with him. For architects, there's sometimes confusion. The modern movement was the first time in the 1920s and 30s where architects embraced certain principles and responsibilities which didn't exist before. Architecture was historically uh, for the elite, for the rich, palaces, churches, uh, temples, uh, uh, opera houses, and there was the vernacular of residential buildings and workshops, which didn't constitute much, uh, you know, they were just like vernacular buildings. But the modern movement said, we architects have responsibility to, to the whole community, to society. If we're doing housing, we have to come up with solutions that are good for the entire population. If we're doing a school, we have a responsibility to the students and the teachers there's a kind of a direct link of responsibility to the impact on the life of those you designed for. And it did not tolerate the selectivity. Well, I'm going to design villas for $10 million for the rich, and I'm happy with that. That's all I do because I enjoy doing that. 
But that ethic that the modern movement embraced has been challenged again and again. Um, after the Second World War, a lot of housing and new cities were built. And they followed the kind of doctrine of the modern movement and they were not very good. They failed. And so then came the critics and said, we don't know how to do new cities and all that. Let's limit ourselves to styling, to design, to the, to the kind of uh, noble and elegant side of architecture, which is, you know, precious designs. Um, and, you know, that eventually led to postmodernism. Precious designs. I haven't yeah. heard that before. Yeah, I, just, I haven't said it before either. That's so, you precious know, precious design. design. And, and you kind of have a very good time and it's an easier life to do that. Uh, some of us didn't give up. Uh, I consider myself part of a group okay, who said, I think in that group is Renzo Piano, Norman Foster, uh, um, many of those who did not embrace postmodernism and did not go for this kind of sculptural formalism. Um, and what's interesting is that one separates objectives and ethics from the results. It could very well be that certain outcomes in terms of uh, uh, the modern movement, because it was kind of caricature-like, we didn't know much about cities at the time, led to not very good solutions, but it does mean that the ethical framework was wrong. So I feel that I don't like the word anymore, form follows function, because function has come to be interpreted as a utilitarian thing. Function is like uh, having enough toilets or the plumbing works in most people's mind. So I, I tend to think in terms of more form follows purpose. You know, what's the purpose of a school? To be a wonderful place for learning. Okay, that's what a school is about. Not about the shape, not about some sculptural thing that the architect was obsessed with at that moment. Are the classrooms wonderful? Is the interaction space great? You know, uh, everything. Everything that makes, everything that makes it a place of well-being and good for education. And you can take that sublime to a concert hall, uh, or you can take it to a, a place of worship, or you can take it to a house or a group of houses. It applies the same way. The solutions are different, the issues are different, but it applies the same way. I absolutely believe that it is the job of architecture to lift the human spirit. I mean, what else is architecture for? Once we have moved out of, you know, mud huts and, and tents, and uh, the log cabin, then if, if not to create an environment which is uplifting for the mind, the body, the spirit, then what else is architecture for? And we do have the resources. And if you look at the history of architecture, then we can see that it has been the goal throughout history um, even uh, when it was um, up to the church uh, who had the resources, then it was always the goal to create for people an uplifting environment. It's making an architecture that uplifts people's spirits and at the same time fulfills their basic needs, you know. I mean, if you have a place that lifts your spirit and it's so hot you can't live in it, or it's so cold you freeze in it, it doesn't work. Yeah. So you've got to deal with the full spectrum of sustainability, of comfort, of resources, while at the same time having the, the sublime. I think that we talked before about, like uh, what when, with Frank Gehry, about the Bilbao effect. But you know, it's interesting because when we think about habitat, you could almost say that the Bilbao effect started with a habitat effect. You know. When habitat was created in 1967, it was the first phenomenon like that of its kind in the world where an architectural uh, idea, exhibit, and then creation caused such a stir. So you had a young kid who had an idea. It was then, they actually built an island in order to create this idea. 
and it wasn't just that it was a phenomenal architectural you know concept and beautiful creation but it was also a humanitarian concept it was also a vision for how people could live in the future sustainable you know ecological environmental and it it, it is still viable that's why you know uh I don't know how many years later, I'm not good at math, but this many years later, it's being used by Safdie and it's still a viable, creative, beautiful, sustainable idea that he is using around the world. It's, it's wonderful. The impact of Habitat in a particular context. Um, when it was finished in 1967, it was probably the most well-known project in the world. That's right. And it probably, because, of, because it's part of Expo, was publicized beyond uh, uh, expectations. And it also had extraordinary impact on the architectural world. I mean, students all over the world, I mean, students still come to me and say, I became an architect because of, of Habitat. And uh, now there are elderly architects who come and tell me, I became an architect because of Habitat, because it's 50 years later. But for a long time, students were doing Habitats in the studios and so on. But in fact, as we came into the 70s, there was a big uh, recessive moment in which urban development and cities, particularly in North America, were not the focus. And Habitat was not proliferating. You certainly weren't seeing Habitats. And I certainly had, in the 70s and 80s, no opportunity to realize Habitat-like projects anywhere. In fact, Why? in the 80s, because there was no demand. There, there were no high-density residential developments except for the lowest standard in North America. Nobody was interested in terracing and for everyone a garden and any of that stuff. And a lot of the critics started saying Habitat is, a, is an ideal that will never be met because it's too expensive to realize and, and it's, it's, it's a failed idea. And my own practice changed because since I had no opportunities doing a residential housing work, I became, uh, I became almost specialized in, in cultural projects, uh, both in Canada and the United States, the National Gallery, the Public Library in Vancouver, in Salt Lake City, the Kaufman Performing Arts Center in Kansas. I mean, I can go on and on. Right. These were all cultural projects. And this started changing really at the turn of the century. After 2000, something started happening. Um, first of all, there was extraordinary explosion of growth in Asia. And I became part of it because Marina Bay Sands was, has become the symbol of the new architecture of Asia. And, and so there were all these new opportunities. We set up a research fellowship within the office to rethink habitat. Can we meet the new densities? Can we deal with mixed use? All the new questions, because when I designed Habitat Montreal, the density of habitat is nothing next to Hong Kong, Shanghai, yeah. Singapore. And that fellowship started develop, developing designs in the office that met these densities. And after 30 years of kind of dormant activity in housing, all of a sudden these new opportunities came. So I've lived long enough to see Habitat ignored and become again the center of architectural interest worldwide. So there's a new generation of architects who, uh, who acknowledge their kind of uh, uh, debt to habitat and are doing projects in its spirit, but saying that this, uh, I mean, there's one in Toronto going up where it's called Habitat 2, uh, you know, owed to the original habitat by, by Bjork Ingels, uh, you know. Up oh, I love him. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And at the same time, uh, our own office has had several opportunities in Singapore, in Qingwandao, in Chongqing, in Colombo, Sri Lanka, yes, yes. Um, in which the concepts and principles of habitat are being applied, not literally, 
the, the lots of different circumstances. It's not prefabricated, but it's for everyone a garden. Yes. And, and so on the street on the twenty fifth floor. Exactly and playgrounds and so on. So this this is something that is now happening as if it took Habitat was really 50 years ahead of its time. That's basically what it says, because yeah. now it's taken root. I absolutely agree with Moshe when he says that uh, every project should be diverse. And uh, that's what keeps uh, great artists young and relevant and um, keeps your mind, you know, busy. and. Uh, He's a, he's a wonderful, optimistic, and, uh, you know, always growing as an artist. First of all, I should say that by design, my practice has resisted any specialization. You know, after the National Gallery, I was inundated with museum commissions. I could easily become the specialist museum. I didn't want that. So when I had the opportunity, I you know, jumped on the Vancouver Library. Then I became a specialist in libraries, and so on and so forth. So recently, somebody asked me, what's the building type you've never done? And I said, one of them is a hospital. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, well, if, that, if you're interested, there's an opportunity. So I'm now completing a hospital in Colombia, in Cartagena. Okay. I'm doing a medical school in Sao Paulo. Okay. Um, I just opened Jewel in Changi Airport, uh, an okay, airport that, project. Yes, okay. and, and before that, I did Ben Gurion Airport. So in a sense, uh, that desire to, to uh, diversify the practice has made us never bored, always dis discovering what's unique about this building type. When we got the Performing Arts Center, I decided that was going to be the best acoustic concert hall in the, in the country. It's actually now been voted one of the 10 best in the world because it seemed to me that that's what the concert hall is all about. Is. The intimacy, the sound, uh, you know, the, 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 the public spaces, <laughs> and the dressing rooms are, 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 are lavish, I mean comfortable. So, so uh, that's the, and therefore there's no favorites. It's just like an ongoing exploration. With Safdie, he really does have the purpose of the architecture to follow what he's doing. And so for him, the art will be, if a building is meant to be a synagogue or meant to be a museum or meant to be a library, then it will be purpose first, and then the art will come. Um, it's a different. It's a different approach. It's it's very very interesting to see how each architect uh, will allow their art to be expressed in a different way. You see, the word art is very complicated for me, because the world art is subject to a lot of interpretation. I think when an architect does his job well in a profound sense, what comes out is art. You can call art. I think if an architect sets out to create art, it's going to be a fiasco. Because mm -hmm. what does it mean? Mm -hmm. He's out to create environment. Mm -hmm. Architecture is a physical environment. And he has to do that well. And if he does it really well, materials come together well, the space, the light, the, the, everything that constitutes architecture, you can't even describe it, it's so multifaceted then it'll be art. But did I set out at Habitat to say I'm going to do a work of art? It would have been absurd. I set out to, to, to solve a housing issue, to resolve a housing issue. Is Habitat art? Absolutely, it's art, but it wasn't the reason it was created. As It was not the objective. And I think that the problem with architects today is that they've been educated to think of themselves as artists, and that, they believe, gives them the same license for doing whatever they felt like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as most artists believe they have license to do. Now, whether a visual artist should have license to do whatever they feel like is a debatable. I personally think they, they should have much more exacting missions than that. 
But I certainly think when an architect embraces that, it's doomed to failure. Because architecture is not sculpture, and it's not art in that sense of everything goes. What I love the most about uh, Moshe Safdie is how he takes nature and brings it in. So, for example, in those three examples that I speak about in the uh, article and in his interview, he has taken water and, uh, and formed it into a waterfall. He's taken a natural downpour uh, in water, like in the, in the, in the Ben Gurion Airport in uh, Singapore, where water accumulates naturally twice a day. And he found a way to make it a fabulous, beautiful, daily show for spectators. And it, it, uh, it's brilliant. Well, it's, for one thing, it shows you how um, architects uh, evolve ideas from project to project. They learn from them. And then some of them are very particular to a project. I mean, when I did Crystal Bridges Museum, uh, in, in Bentonville, in Arkansas. It was about the valleys and learning from the mill towns and creating ponds in the valley and building around them. That idea applies to Crystal Bridges, it's particular. But the idea of how a roof relates to the sky and how it relates to rain and, and so on is kind of more universal. And so it's an idea that can evolve from project to project. Just like the idea of for everyone a garden, is not particular. It's true to habitat, but it's also true to many other things I've done. So in Ben Gurion Airport, there was this idea that you're going to have a rotunda with a dome. And I thought, how banal would be is the dome? You, it's so overused. What if I did a dish and I suspended that dish column free over that gathering space from which you go to your plane? and and. Of course, once you do a dish, it collects water at the bottom. Right. So what are you going to do with the water? So I said to the airport team, let's bring in another waterfall. First, they said, you're nuts. And then we showed them that the technical issues could be addressed. And Svika Frank, who was the project manager, said, go for it. And in fact, they don't maintain it well. But in fact, <laughs> they, this was the worst first, first waterfall in the center of a major public space. And in Israel, it had deep meaning because, you know, rain means so much, but it's also seasonal. So when I came to Singapore, uh, first in that mini application, but particularly in Jewel, uh, I first had the idea that if you're going to have a major shopping area, and they asked us to, and this was a competition, and there were four competitors, each developer with their own architect, and they said, we need a million square feet of shopping, we need airport space, we need this and that, we need parking space, and we want an attraction. Mm -hmm. They didn't say what attraction. Our competitor came up with dinosaurs, and somebody else came back with mummies. You know, everybody was thinking Disney. And I thought it should be something timeless that, you know, who's going to go back and see dinosaurs? Well, why would a passenger want to see dinosaurs, you know? How, what would attract Singaporeans and the passengers? And we started thinking of the kind of magical garden like no other garden. And first, it was a great big glass dome. And actually, the way it evolved is we had a problem with the height. Uh -huh. Because next to it is the control tower. And the control tower had to maintain the sight line. And that meant that the dome couldn't peak. The, you couldn't do it. So I had to crush it in. Well, if you take a dome and you crush it in, you get the shape of a torus or a donut right. or a bagel, right. okay? So that's the shape of a donut or, or, or a bagel. And that meant that the entire roof surface is going to drain inbound. And we rapidly calculated that that would mean 12,000 gallons a minute on a good rainfall in Singapore. And in Singapore, a good rainfall is once a day practically. And so this is now like the tallest in the world, 40 meter uh, waterfall. Uh, it comes down massively. When it doesn't rain, we pump it. The pumping has major impact on air conditioning, positive impact on the, on the climate control. 
the garden is absolutely lush, it's doing well, and ten, hundreds of thousands of people a day are coming into that building. It's just caught the public imagination in a way that I've never experienced, not even in Habitat. When an architect does his job well, in a profound sense, you can call that art. And that is what a safety does. So actually, as an architect, you can absolutely call him an artist. And Capital Land, who were my client on several projects, asked me to participate. And the Chinese arranged another competition, and we won it. And I felt it's interesting about projects in China, more, more so than elsewhere. They, they crave for the narrative that explains the design. It is part of Chinese symbolism and feng shui. For example, when you eat they, and, and you serve the particular dish, you're told this is good for your eyes, and this is good for your digestion, and this is good for your skin. Feng shui is an ancient Chinese uh, study um, of spaces, of directions, of energies, um, and used in um, placement, not just of furniture within houses, but also of houses themselves, right? And, uh, and Safdi uh, spoke about it a little bit in our um, interview. And, um, you know, it's very complicated if you get uh, deeply into feng shui. And I can't claim to completely understand it. Um, but I believe uh, that it has a lot of uh, merit. And when you expand that into architecture and art, the narrative is important. And I developed the narrative which is about the sail ships right. that, that are part of the history. And I knew that I, I have 12, square, 12 million square meters uh, of uh, feet, 12 million square feet of space eight towers, massive density. So I began by shaping the buildings in such a way that they formed a kind of a armada of, of, sail, of sails. And then by tying everything together by a conservatory at the 50th floor, right. uh, this gives you kind of the dynamic feeling of a sail ship leading the city down the river. And I think that it's helped a lot yeah. uh, in terms of capturing the imagination of the city leaders. And then once approved, of course, it wasn't easy. We have a subway station in the building, a, a shipping terminal, a major bus terminal. We had to coordinate all these public transportation into the architecture. It is by far the most complex thing we ever undertook. And actually, I'm really proud of my team and my office who could do a 12 million square feet with Amazing. full control yeah. and realize it in, in yeah. six years. How many architects did you have working on it? Well, in the, in the design phases, we had at least 40. Wow. Uh, we also had partners in Hong Kong and in Chongqing working with us uh, on the implementation plans. And, you know, major engineering groups, landscape groups. I mean, this takes... This takes orchestrating, yeah. and and you know our office orchestrated all these different participants, so that uh, when we open at the end of the year, when we complete at the end of the year, this is going to be one of the major pieces in China. Incredible. Moshe Safdie is a great thinker. He was a, a great teacher at Harvard. He. Uh, has profound philosophies about his architecture, and. Um, his humanitarian vision and optimism are really evident in his uh, designs. And um, I think that he is one of the great architects of our time. And what he has uh, given the world in his designs will last because he tried to create with his designs a worldview and it actually has worked because what started in Habitat in 67, 77, 87, 97, 2007, 2017, 2020, so we're talking 53 years later, is still relevant, is still being used in 
several communities around the world. It, it's fabulous. Kind of in an unexpected way, things come their way. The other day I was uh, asked to participate in a competition for doing a synagogue, a church, and a mosque okay. for Abu Dhabi in Ooh. the museum district. All three in Abu All Dhabi? All three together. And, you know, I put a lot of, a lot of uh, soul into it, and I came up with a very exciting design. Lo and behold, we didn't win it. Ooh. I can show you the design. Yeah, we did exactly. not win it. Uh, I thought, modestly, that this was by far the best design, one of the best things I ever did. So maybe it'll get built somewhere, you know. Uh, but I'm telling you that simply as opportunities come, sometimes there's disappointments. But architects, are, are in many ways, respond not unlike musicians. I mean, I used to think, you know, why can't uh, Mozart just sit down and write a quartet? No, he had to have it commissioned by this or by that. He never sat and did a trio or quartet or this and that unless somebody had asked for it. And I think architecture is that way too. But if I was to sort of uh, design my own project and say that's what I want to do next, I'd go back to the original habitat. The original habitat was for an urban complex. We built a piece of it, but the schools and the shops and the office structures, all that mixed use together was never realized. In some ways, I've, ad I've addressed that in Chongqing and in other projects, but to do it in a more holistic way, a whole neighborhood, village, or let's call it a, a community in this high density context, of, of today uh, at the scale of the original habitat, that would be a nice thing for a finale. Again, uh, what I notice with uh, brilliant designers and, and uh, great thinkers is that they're optimistic. They would never change what they do for a single minute. They love what they do and uh, they're grateful for every moment that they have uh, to do what they do. It was an honor and a pleasure to have that time with him. If I dare say, I think what you're really saying is, why can't we build a better world? Well, I guess that is part of it, because there's days where I'm, I give up. I never give up because I'm too much of an optimist, but I'm distressed. I walk through some cities. I say, why? You know, why this ugliness? Why this congestion? Why this irrationality? And then there's moments you say, maybe it's possible. But it sure is going to take a lot of political, economic change. It's not, the challenge is to, the challenge is not to architects. The challenge is in part to architects, but mostly to our political leadership. Mm -hmm. However, we can show them I'm so grateful that we have great minds like yours to envision at least these better spaces. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Moshe Safdi. Thank you so much for joining us. Please find us online at at home in Canada CA for more interviews with Tiffany Pratt, Mike Holmes, and Rita Briansky. Thank you so much for watching, and see you soon.